Oh, okay. Well, we're doing questions. All right. Uh, oh, this is mine. Ah. So we got a 55-year-old male with chronic dyspnea, and he's intubated and started on mechanical ventilation for respiratory failure. Pressure volume scalars. What the fuck? On the ventilator. <laughs> Should decrease change in can okay, you tell I wrote this question <laughs> in volume for each unit change in pressure as compared to normal values of the following options which is the most likely cause of respiratory failure wow this is a horrible question now that I look at it <laughs> okay since I didn't actually read this question before right now <laughs> I was in the same password okay. So, chronic dyspnea. He's got, yeah, chronic mm -hmm. dyspnea. He's mm -hmm. got decreased changes in volume for each unit change in pressure. So, okay, so I picked this question, not having read it, but I picked this question because I presented on the lung volume function curves. So, which obstructive oh. versus restrictive, which should decrease changes in lung volume. So that's an obstructive? Yes, it's pulmonary fibrosis. It's a restrictive disease. Correct. But the rest are obstructive. Right. Um, ALS, this is an obstructive disease due to mechanical issues, as is obstructive, sentry anacinar emphysema is obstructive, and alpha antitrypsin is just pan anacinar emphysema. So it's also obstructive. So yes, fibrosis. This one's also mine, but I actually read this one. A uh, 63-year-old man presents to his primary care physician complaining of excessive daytime sleepiness. He sees approximately eight to nine hours per night and believes his sleep is good. Quality is good. However, his wife knows that he often snores loudly during sleep. He has never experienced muscle weakness or hallucinations. He has also been experiencing headaches in the morning and endorses a depressed mood. His physical exam is most notable for his large body habitus with a BMI of 34. What is the best description of the underlying mechanism for this patient's excessive daytime sleepiness? We've got insufficient sleep duration, Circadian rhythm sweet wake sleep wake site disorder, poor oral pharyngeal tone, deficiency of the neuropeptides or and A or and B, and psychiatric disorder. I wanna say three. Yeah. Oh wait. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Correct. Right, because if you have sleep insufficient apnea. sleep duration, yeah, we're talking sleep apnea. He's overweight. Wife says that he snores. Uh, often snores loudly during sleep. He sleeps a normal duration. He thinks his sleep quality is good, but he is uh, headaches in the morning, which is classic for sleep apnea, and he has a depressed mood, which can also be translated to sleepiness during the day. So, yeah, all these other ones have something to do with either uh, a circadian issue. Or um, narcolepsy? Four. Correct. That's what I was getting at. Four has to do with narcolepsy, but the fact that he says there's no weakness or hallucinations. No hallucinations. Yeah. There's no hypnagogic or hypnopompic. What's that one? Hypnopompic. Pompic, thank you. So, um,. Yeah, that's how you rule those out. Okay, any questions? Oh, actually, I, I, I believe this was a U-World question. Going to poor oral pharyngeal tone. If we want, so we have, for sleep apnea, we have, you know, um, you can either do a CPAP machine, you can do things like uh, propping the patient up, what nerve stimulation technique could be used to treat sleep apnea? You can use these electro, electro stimulation, stimulate a particular nerve. I know this was a U-World or, or first aid question. 
such an outlandish question, but still something that could be asked. So. Cranial nerve nine depresses the tongue. Which, which nerve? Which cranial? Which, which cranial nerve uh, lets you stick your tongue out? Twelve. Twelve. Yes. The hypoglossal nerve. So if you stimulate the hypoglossal nerve, it will, it will cause the, uh, it, it cause anterior motion of the tongue. And it will open up the posterior oral pharynx. I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure you will question somewhere in there. But anyways. Oh, sorry. That top is cut off a bit. But. Oh, that's me. All right. Um, a 15-year-old girl is brought in for evaluation of amenorrhea. She has never menstruated, but her mother has menarche at age 14. The patient has no other medical problems or allergies. She takes no medications and does not use tobacco, alcohol, or drugs. The patient plays the violin for her high school orchestra and is the captain of her junior varsity tennis team. She is not sexually active. Her height is 5'8", her weight is 143, and BMI is 21.2. Examination shows fully developed sexual, sexual, secondary sexual characteristics. Um, pelvic ultrasound shows shortened vaginal canal with a rudimentary uterus. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis in this patient? Um, a, 21 hydroxylase deficiency, B, androgen insensitivity syndrome, C, Kalman syndrome, D, Kleinfelter syndrome, E, Mullerian aplasia, or F, triple X syndrome. E. I heard E for elephant. E for elephant, yes. So this is my tip off. Yeah, exactly. Shortened vaginal canal. So that's the external um, part of, yeah. External, internal. I don't know. So, what would it be? I think okay, it's so. internal. No, 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 right. So, so she has a shortened vaginal canal so that her only her distal vagina has formed because if she has Mullerian ectasia, then her proximal vagina, uterus, and fallopian tubes haven't formed because those are all uh, Mullerian organs. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have those forming, then uh, you're going to have external female characteristics, but you're going to have, like she said, she's never menstruated. Yeah. So you're going to have amenorrhea, or the, a menarche, and, um, uh, well, yeah, she's going to be infertile. So yeah. You can have all the unprotected sex as well. Never mind. No, I won't say that. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Still get bad diseases. I'll get pregnant. Which we'll well, talk we'll about, sure. which we'll talk about in one of my questions later on. Oh, okay. <laughs> Any questions on this one? Alright. Oh, here we go. Yeah, thanks. Okay, you. So, yeah, paramedic and effort, you learn in ducks. Uh, does anybody need to read all this? <laughs> <laughs> For all of our viewers out there, you can pause the video and read and absorb. Alright. <laughs> A 41-year-old woman, Gravita Zero, came to the office for evaluation of pregnancy. Menarche was at age 12, and her menses reoccur every 30 days and last five days. The patient and her husband have been trying to conceive for the past year and plan intercourse during her fertile window, according to the ovulation predictor kit. She has no medical problems, takes no medications, and has no allergies. BMI is 23. Vital signs and physical examination are normal. If fertilization and implantation occurred this cycle, when would the B beta ACG level first be detectable in the serum? Um, A, one day after fertilization, B, three days after fertilization, C, eight days after fertilization, D, 
14 days after fertilization, or E, on the day of fertilization. So C, C and D, it's not A or B. C, because D is with urine. Because implantation occurs at day six. Um, and right after implantation, when the HCDs yeah, are getting... Oh, see? I'm, I'm, I'm going to see that. Yeah. All right, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah, Pete, you're right in that um, implantation does occur at day six, and so after that, you're able to detect beta HCG, so. Six, day six, it sticks. That's what I remember. Yeah. And because I teach it, so. <laughs> it does right. stick at day six. <clears throat> six, at six. So, so uh, anyways, it's when the implantation occurs, once implantation occurs, that's when Bay HCG is able to start uh, being detected. And she did ask for in serum because well, specifically. Yeah, oh, because like you said, if it was in the urine, that would have been different. So did it 14 days for urine? Mm -hmm. So two weeks for Prego test, right? For PT test. Yes. Oh. Fun fact, um, 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 hang on, hang on. Oh, it's, um, I heard this on the radio the other day. Ikea, do you guys hear about this? Ikea has a new, oh, pregnancy <laughs> Ikea came, Ikea in, uh, I think it was like Sweden, they had a new magazine ad for a, a baby crib, but the magazine the page of the ad, you know, like if you're scrolling through a magazine, it'll have like, you know, like those little rip outs where you can, it has like samples of cologne or perfume and you can, you know, like okay. smell it. Or, 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 Sample or for pregnancy test? So they said in the crib <clears throat> ad, if you pee on this crib oh, ad, it will tell you if you're pregnant. And what? if you are pregnant, meaning it's a positive ACG test, it would show you a printout code that would give you 50% off. Of the so it's like a scratch off, but like with your pee. It's, it's a piss off. Pregnant. <laughs> I'm not making uh, you, you can't make it. <laughs> this is for real. I hope it's not that guy with testicular cancer. Hey, you remember. <laughs> so, yes. Um, uh, I like you yeah, Ikea is trying at any opportunity to compete with Amazon. Anyways. <laughs> on that note. A five-year-old girl is brought to the physician by her parents because of intense perianal itching, especially during the night. The child is otherwise healthy and her development has been normal. Physical exam shows perianal excoriation. Cellulose adhesive tape is applied to the perianal area of the child shortly after she wakes up in the morning. Microscopic analysis of the tape reveals the presence of eggs that are asymmetrically flattened on one side. Which of the following is the most appropriate treatment for this patient's condition? E. I didn't give an answer, I just said E. Okay. A, C, or E. We're I'll talking about... E. Enterobius <clears throat> vermicularis, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Z is the butthole thing. <laughs> the tape test. Yeah, the butthole tapeworm. Yeah, I'm going with E for elephant as well. Oh! Albendazole. Albendazole. Okay. I know it's. Albendazole. or albendazole. Well, Bendazole is first line for Enterobius vermicularis. Um, e would be for Schistosoma or Clonors, something. Hermit. Something, something. And other I ones. my little parasites. <laughs> All of those other ones. Um, let's see. Diethylcarbamazine is for Strongyloides. So the Big ass worms that get stuck in your intestine. That fun stuff. 
ivermectin for oh actually i got that wrong diethyl carbamazine for loa loa the one that's in your eye and ivermectin for strongyloides the one that's in your intestines and then i think i think you left an r out of it i think so too my Ferdimox for trypanosomes and Chagas disease. Well, well, things we will probably never prescribe unless we go back to San Jose. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, a 22-year-old woman comes to the emergency department with fevers and arthralgias. She recently had unprotected sexual intercourse with a new male partner. Her temperature is 101.1, blood pressure is 118 over 76, pulse is 102, and respirations are 16. Examination shows several pustules on the dorsal aspects of her forearms. Her right wrist and ankle are tender on palpation. Gram-negative bacteria isolated from this patient's blood produce an, an enzyme that splits the IgA molecule at the hinge region. Which of the following is likely to be the most important role of this bacterial enzyme in the course of the infection? Talking about um, Neisseria, or gonorrheal arthralgia? Mm -hmm. Donald mm -hmm. So, a disseminated gonorrheal infection. That's disseminated gonorrheal. With a triad. An enzyme that splits the IgA molecule. Okay, so so uh, at the uh -huh. region, this is where this is where mm -hmm. complement. Mm -hmm. B. Comp oh yeah, there is. Is it B? Well, I guess I'm the one. No, I have the power. Well, no, no. It no, is oh, not oh, B. No. <laughs> so, IgA antibodies usually bind to pili and other membrane proteins involved mucosa, in so bacterial so adherence to mucosa. So, when IgA is in secretions, its purpose is to prevent bacteria from adhering to the actual mucosal surface. So, with Complement. IJ is a weak activator of the classic complement pathway, but impairment of complement mediated cell lysis is seen with MND. Staphylococcal protein A. Oh <laughs> and uh, impaired opsonization and phagocytosis with. Encapsulated bacteria. IgG. Yes, that one has that. And impaired secondary immune response generation. Um, IgA IgG. does not play a role in that, so, yep. IgG again. And uh, promoting intracellular survival um, can be seen. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> with Mycobacterium, tuberculosis, Leprae, Legionella, and Ehrlichia. Alright. Uh, a 35 year old woman presents to the physician with weakness of both upper extremities, headache, and multiple second degree burns on her hands. The patient has no prior significant medical history and cannot recall any recent episodes of trauma. Although physical exam uncovers no motor defects in the upper extremities, it reveals the absence of pain and temperature sensation in the upper extremities bilaterally. Position and vibration sense are intact in the upper extremities, and there are no lower extremity abnormalities. An MRI of the spinal column shows dilatation within the cervical spinal cord, which diagnosis consists with this patient's findings. The <laughs> yeah, it is. A lot of extremities. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> D for D. dumb. There you go. Yeah, that's correct answer. Yeah, that's correct. Nice. Correct. 
Oh, and that's the answer choice. Just the answer explanation, if you guys. Yeah, so starting my area, cape like distribution, leading to the burn injury. <clears throat> yep, yep, yep. yep, yep. And all those extremities. Man, all uh, those extremities. <laughs> all 14 of her extremities. <laughs> An 83 year old man is brought to the ED by ambulance. His temperature is 99.3, pulse is 117, blood pressure is 87 over 53, and respirations are 25. He reports he had an MI about seven days prior. On physical exam, he appears uptunded and pale. Bilateral rails are auscultated, and a new holosystolic murmur is heard at the apex of the heart, radiating to the axilla. Pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is increased. Sodium nitroprusside is administered while awaiting definitive surgical therapy. Sodium nitroprusside is an optimal treatment for this patient because of which of the following properties? Okay, for dog. This is after the yeah, this the vasodilator. So oh wait, I just press side is an arterial dilator. First of all, what does he have? He's, got, your... he's got okay. So uh, PPF eighty three. Yeah, the Oh, yeah. He has a, oh, he has like a wall Are rupture. You? No. So he's got a papillary muscle rupture um, yeah, possibility, so. but he, it's he's in cardiogenic, cardiogenic shock. shock. Yeah. Right. He's in Due to the papillary muscle rupture. Yeah. yeah so we want to. So yeah, decreasing the afterload would be good because then you're decreasing the work ventricular workload of the heart. Right. <clears throat> that is the correct answer. Okay. And the next slide has the answer choice, even though it's very complicated. So there's got Keep on your finger. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> you want after a little reduction. <clears throat> yeah. So you can use other treatments, um, but you want the first thing to do is to decrease the afterload. Yes, so the blood can flow retrograde. <clears throat> so I uh, just totally random thing. What is the clinical definition of a fever? What is a cutoff oh, to oh. say, boom, this is a fever? Um, low grade, Over. high grade, what are you going for? Isn't there something like temperature and blood pressure? No, no, we're, I'm going oh, just temperature. Just and temperature. you can answer me either centigrade. Oh, or no, heart rate. The heart rate. 101 <laughs> degrees Fahrenheit. Or above. <laughs> I think it's, right. 100. If right. it's like above 98, 99, you're starting no, a low. low. I said 100 first. Is that a low grade fever? And then when you hit 100, it's a high grade fever? Tulsi's closest. She wins. It's 100.4. 100.4. And the reason, the reason That's is because. That's that point where. No, that is 38 degrees Celsius. That is the reason. And again, I, I do not. Disadvantage never being away. gave a shit about that discrepancy. You always feel like. 102 fever, 99 point whatever, no fever, but it's 100.4 is like, boom, that is clinically a fever, and it's because you have crossed into 38 degrees Celsius. Didn't think that was a big deal. I've gotten, I did infectious this whole last week. I've gotten two questions wrong specifically because it was like 100.5 versus 100.3, so... 38 degrees Celsius equals 100.4 degrees. Just hard drive. Just something to keep in mind. Because I just saw, uh, someone just had, I think your last question, I had like 99 point whatever. <clears throat> so, I don't know, man. Just, just 99.3. There you go. Just shit to keep in your brain. 